of you would say you are into movies? We have any movie buffs? I am a movie buff. And you know, one thing I have realized when I'm watching movies, these, my, this might be the worst sentence, okay, that anybody ever says in a movie. Stick to the plan. And of course, you know, as, you, as you're watching the movie, they stick to the plan, and it's amazing, and everything goes well, right? And, and all of a sudden, the credits roll in five minutes. What do you mean that's not a movie? Ah, no, you know, you know what it is. It's usually some, uh, one, one character says, stick to the plan. And then they go, no, we can't. We got to do this. And what happens is what could have ended in five minutes now becomes an hour and a half long thing. And what happens is they're, as they've gone off and they've gone rogue is, you know, if it's an action movie, somebody's getting captured, right? And there's going to be some torturing going on. It's just, it's just part of it. Um, and they didn't stick to the plan. But what happens is ultimately it all works out in the end. Um, the protagonist goes, and if it's Clint Eastwood, they're riding off what into the sunset on a horse. Okay? It's amazing. So stick to the plan. But as we all know in life, we rarely stick to the plan. I mean, we have a plan. As my wife used to say, um, she says, well, Darian, you know, everybody has a plan, but I would like a plus. But, you know, there's a plan we have. And we have a plan. And I'm a planner, okay? I think things through to the very end, okay? Now, I'm not a big picture guy. I'll just, well, actually, no, I am a big picture guy. Hang on. I'm not a planner, okay? I'm a big picture guy. But I've got a plan, all right? I know where I'm going. Now, if you're ever like me, I've got a plan, but oh, wow, this looks interesting. And here I am, I'm outside, and I'm like, oh, wait, 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 I got to get back. And I come back, and then I'm like, oh, but, wow, do you know that new series is out? I, I, I don't know if you guys are ever like that. Do any, of you, do any of you make a plan, and then you just veer off to the left, and then you come back, and then you go back, you get, you get close to coming back, but then you veer off again, and then you get back on, and you're doing well, and then you veer off again? S- sort of. Well, the good news is, is, you're not the first person to ever do that. Actually, uh, there's, a, there's a man that we've been following. His name's Abram. He is really good at this. This is why I like Abram. This is also why I get annoyed with Abram. So anyway, if you'll turn over a couple pages and go to Genesis chapter 12, we're going to look at verses 10 through 20. Last week, we looked at the call. This week, we look at when trouble comes. So Genesis chapter 12, verses 10 through 20. Genesis 12, starting in verse 10, it says this. It says, Now there was a famine in the land. And Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, This is his wife. They will kill me, but let you live. Say you are my sister. So that I will be treated well for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. When Abram came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw Sarai was a very beautiful woman. And when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh. And she was taken into his palace. He treated Abram well for her sake, and Abram acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, male and female servants, and camels. But the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife, Sarai. So Pharaoh summoned Abram, What have you done to me? He said, Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister? So that I took her to be my wife. Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. Then Pharaoh order, gave orders about Abram to his men, and they sent him on his way and his wife and everything he had. 
So the first thing that we have to see about this text is there's a famine. Famines aren't great. I would not do well in a famine, all right? Okay, I'm just going to be honest with you. I like to eat, all right? And if I was told I couldn't eat, there would be issues. Now, I might have a rocking body at some point. Anyway, I shouldn't have said that. But anyway, uh, uh, but, but famines equal bad. Let's just face it. Uh, a lack of food is not a good thing. So what do they do? Is they get up and they go to Egypt which at the time was the best place. They had the fields, they had everything, everything there, and they, were, and they were able to support more people. Now, before they get to Egypt, Abram has an idea to help God. I, 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 let's just call it what it is. He, he, he starts to think and he says, you know, I have this promise for, from God. God has promised that he's going to make me into this great nation and and all of these amazing things are going to happen and I will have descendants as numerous as the stars. But wait a minute. That can't happen if I'm dead. Hmm. You know, my wife is gorgeous. Camilla is beautiful, by the way. But this is Abram. All right. So anyway, so he's going through and he says, my wife is gorgeous. And, you know, and, you know, people are going to see her and they're going to take me out if I if they see that I'm her husband. So that way they can take me out of the picture. I'm an old man at this point. So you're going to. So here's the deal. Sarah, this is how we're going to make this work. I want you to tell everybody. You're my sister. There are so many weird things with that, but we're not going to go there. But you're my sister. And, and what happens is, they, is the family moves into Egypt and the Egyptians see her and they're like, wow, she is beautiful. And she is so beautiful that word goes on to Pharaoh. And what happens is Pharaoh takes her into her home and, and, and she's in Pharaoh's palace. And yes, Abram is treated well. But I would argue Abram has failed as a man. I'd argue that. Let's face it. When you get married, number one, I'm not... I love Camille, and sometimes she, you know, we get into arguments, and I, but I wouldn't trade her for anything. And I wouldn't let anybody, any harm come to my wife. I would never do that. But Abram, who is afraid for his own life, has given up the one thing that he is supposed to protect and to cherish. And not only has he given her up, she is now Pharaoh's. And what does that mean? That means another man is with his wife. And we're not going to go any further than that. But think about that. Would you allow somebody else to take your wife? No. But this is what Abram has done. He's so afraid about his own safety that he would give up his own wife so that Pharaoh could have her so that he might live. And yes, he was treated well. Yes, he got these animals. Yes, he has servants. Yes, he has all of these things. And yes, his wealth has increased. But I believe that he has failed in this moment. Because the one thing he's supposed to protect and cherish above all things he has given up to save his own skin. And why? Because Abram believed God could not save him. Abram did not believe that God's plan was better than his own plan. And so he says, he cannot save me from physical harm because he's not physically here. And now what has happened is his fear has taken away the one thing that he should always protect and always cherish. Just to save his own skin. But like Abram, sometimes we think our plans are better than God's plan. 
Let's let that sink in. Sometimes we think we know better than God. It's true, we do. So, uh, sometimes we, 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 we say these things and it says, God, if we just do it my way, my, my way is so much better. God, you set up the end destination and I'm cool with that and that sounds good, but God, if we just do it my way, God, if, if you just understand that I know better than you, and, 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 and we'll go on and we'll, say, we'll think things. We may not say this because that would be horrible and we realize that we can't say it, but we think it. We think that sometimes God does not know what he is talking about. And so what we do is we then uh, devise and set up our own backup plan in case God's plan doesn't work out. And so we've got backup plans. And, and sometimes... You've got your backup plans have backup plans. And even your backup plans of the backup plans have backup plans, all right? I know you're out there. And, and so just in case this doesn't work out, I, I've got this in my back pocket. Just in case God doesn't move and God doesn't work through and God, God doesn't come through, I've got something to keep me safe. And... and and, and, and honestly, sometimes we'll use this plan to wiggle through op different obstacles so we can feel better. We may lie, we may cheat, we may say a story, we may do this, we may do that. It doesn't matter. We'll do all of these things to avoid discomfort. But sometimes, I believe, God wants us to feel a little bit of discomfort. Sometimes, God needs us to feel pain. Sometimes, God's desire is just for us to go through those obstacles and go through those trials. Why? Because we are all unfinished project, projects. And God may be wanting us to go through some pain and go through some hurt so that we can be better suited for His calling. Yes, Abram's got a call to be a great nation, but I'll be honest, I don't think he's father of the year material yet. And yet God needed him to suffer a little bit and to go through some trials and go through some things to eventually lead him to the man that we would call the father of faith. But he's not there yet. And for so many of us, we have to go through some things. But we say we have a better way after all. God, God gives the vision. And, and we like the vision, okay? We like the idea. I mean, how many of you would agree that you want to have purpose? I am glad there's seven of you. For everybody else, figure it out. But anyway, so, so God gives the vision. We want purpose. We want meaning. But you know, I, we've lived a little bit, okay? And so we want to do it our way. And so what that means is we know the best way to handle these situations. And, it's, and so we, we go through, we, we backpedal, we do all of these other things that we do. And, and what happens ultimately, usually, at least in my experience, whenever I think I know best, is well, we realized we were completely wrong. And not only are we completely wrong, more than likely, you're probably worse off than you were in the first place. And we start, and then <laughs> what gets even better is, is after we do all of this, we scream out, Why, God? Why did you allow this to happen? And God is just probably sitting back there and saying, you know, if you had stuck to the plan, if you had done what you should have done from the beginning, if you should have, if you should have listened, if you had done this, if you had done the right thing, if you had done it the right way, you wouldn't be here. But I do believe we learn in those situations. And like Abram, he, he needs to learn a lesson. He has to learn that he can trust and rely on God. After all, faith is new to him. 
right? I mean, he's had this great call. He's, he's stepped into faith. He started this journey of faith, and now he has to learn. I think every one of us go through that. For me, it was I was baptized, and then shortly after, my brother was killed. It was hard. It was difficult, and I didn't understand that. I mean, how can that happen to a new believer? But I do believe it's in these horrible moments that we can learn to trust God more and that where God starts coming through and God starts showing things. And I know for many of you, you've all got something similar to that. And if you don't, bless you. But you will. Because we all go through trials and struggles. And that's what helps grow our faith. But let's get back to Abram. What happens? Well, Abram has made a mess of things. It's true. I, I mean, it's, it's not good. Uh, another man has his wife. He's in a foreign land. He's by himself. Sure, he's wealthy, I guess. But, but God comes to the rescue. And what does he do? He inflicts severe diseases on Pharaoh and his household. God says, wow, you have really messed this up. Now I'm going to have to show up and fix this. And so God shows up and he inflicts these diseases. And then all of a sudden, um, Pharaoh starts to realize, wait, why is this happening? Oh, this is not Abram's sister. This is his wife. Well, she is his sister, and we're, but we're, we'll deal with that another week. But anyway, um, but anyway, um, but but it's not good. And so it comes back to Pharaoh. And what does he do? Hey, Pharaoh's not happy. I, I don't know about you, but how many of you would sit here and say, man, Darren, I love when people lie to me. It's just my favorite thing. So Pharaoh doesn't like being lied to. And he goes over and he says, why did you do this? Basically, why did you lie to me? Why did you tell me she is your sister when she is your wife? Why did you lie to me? Number two, why would you allow this to happen to your family? And if, if I were Pharaoh, I would also probably ask the question, what kind of man are you? that you're going to allow this to happen to your own household. But what happens after this conversation is he, he lets them leave. And, and he, he gets to leave with all of this wealth and everything he's accumulated and he's able to move on. And, and, and yes, in this sense, Abram, I guess, is, is better off, but for me, I just keep thinking, what is that relationship like with Sarai at that moment? You allowed this to happen because you were more worried about your own safety. But he gets to move on and, 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 I, and, I, and I love what God does here. I think this is more about God than Abram in this one. But God took Abram's unbelief God took Abram's fear. God took his, um, Abram's unwillingness to protect his family, to take care of the things that were his responsibility. And what does he do? He restores Sarai back to Abram. And he also gives Abram the supplies and everything he needs to thrive. He gives him wealth. Abram went from being a poor man to a rich man real quick. And so God used this moment in his unbelief and his undesire to do what he should do to lift him up. And not only that, but to show Abram that he is faithful. That if God promises it, he's going to deliver it. Now, as we continue on this series, you're going to get annoyed because Abram falls into the same trap over and over and over again. He's very consistent at not trusting God. And you're going to see that over these next few weeks. And some of you are going to be like, Darian, why are we still talking about this? And let me ask you this. How many of you struggle with the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over and over, and over again? 
And how many of us, how many people get annoyed that you are still struggling with the same thing? You know, I used to think when I became a believer that it would get easier to not like sin. Like I, 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 I sat in the pews and, and I thought like the older people were just so put together, okay? Like, I was just like, you know, they don't struggle with sin. They don't struggle with anything. And then I realized that that's not true. And so what we're going to do is over these next rest of these eight weeks, and we're going to finish up this sermon in just a second, is we're going to realize that we struggle with a lot of the same things. And we deal with a lot of the same things that we were dealing with when you were 21, all right? And yet God still keeps coming through and loving us. So if we're to take something from this, we must learn to trust God even when he may lead us to unsafe places. Egypt wasn't the best place for him. It wasn't the best place for Abram. It wasn't even necessarily the safest place for Abram as we find out that he's scared to die. And so we must learn to trust God even when he may lead us to unsafe places. And so we must learn that God will provide even in the worst places. And like Abram, we must learn that God will provide us with safety even when it's bleak. Even, even when there's a, gonna be a, even if there's a moment in your life where there's a moment right now. I don't know, I don't know all everybody's story. I know most of you, and I've had conversations with most of you. I hope I've had, had conversations with all of you. But there's probably been a point, a point in your life, or maybe there is one right now where maybe you're jobless. Maybe you've been let go. And you're worried about how in the world am I going to provide? That's an unsafe and uncomfortable situation, right? And you've got to sit there and you've got to trust God's going to come through even though there's no prospects. Or, or maybe there's, a, there's an unsafe, uncomfortable situation in your marriage right now. And, you're, and you don't know what to do with that. You're, you're sitting there and you're, you're just hoping and praying that God is going to come through and it may be easier to go do something else. And yet God says, hang in there. There may be an uncomfortable situation with your kids and you're wondering, God, what are you doing here? I'm seeing them go this way and yet they need to be following you and yet they don't want anything to do with you. That's an unsafe place to be in, isn't it? That's a hard place to be in. And yet God says, be faithful. To trust in Him. And trust that He's going to lead. And that He's going to move. And He's going to work. The problem is, like Abram, we want to take control of everything and we want to have all the control. And what ultimately what happens is we make things worse. And yet God says have faith. Doesn't mean we don't, we don't do everything that we can do. But that does mean for those of us who are control freaks. That the things that we cannot control. That we have no business trying to control. We give that to God. I know you don't like that. Nobody likes that. Because we don't know what God's thinking all the time, all right? But God says, trust Him. And so what that means is God will provide for us. And that also means that we have to trust that He's going to come through. Now, that doesn't mean he's going to come through just as you want him to come through. It rarely happens how I would have it gone. I mean, I think back, you know, sometimes I'll watch sports or, you know, chore choreograph things, and I will say, man, I would have done it this way. Well, I'm not a writer. 
And in the same way, you may think, I would have done it this way. But then we go back and we start processing and we start thinking. And we realize, you know, if if he'd done it this way, this would have never happened. Oh, man, and if, if that didn't happen, then you know that wouldn't have happened. And, and then if that didn't happen, I mean, for me, let me just walk you through it, okay? Um, you know, if my brother didn't die, I would have never understood the importance of the church family. And if I had never understood the importance of the church family, then I probably would have went on to SMU to become a lawyer. And if I had gone on to SMU and became a lawyer then I never would have went to Oklahoma Christian. If I'd never gone to Oklahoma Christian, I would have never got to experience the great people, but more importantly, I would have never got to meet Camille Michaela Cave, who's my wife. And if that didn't happen, then you know what? We wouldn't be expecting a child in November. And then if that didn't happen, I would have never got to do ministry. Or maybe I would have done ministry in some way. Okay, let's be realistic. Um, But I never would have got to come here. I would have never got to spend time with you. I would have never got to do all of these things. If these things had not happened in my life, everything else wouldn't happen. And what happens then is whenever we stop and we start to think about these things, we start to say, you know, God, there was no other way. Yeah, we wish we wouldn't have gone through some of the things we've been through, but those things have made you who you are today. And so we can trust God no matter what. But finally, as we we come to a closing, I have to acknowledge this. God can also use our mistakes to place us in better circumstances. Now, that doesn't mean there's not a journey that goes along with it. But God can use our mistakes, our shortcomings, our failures, and everything else you've ever done to further His kingdom. Because God looks at our brokenness and He says He can use that. God looks at our shortcomings and says, oh man, I'm going to use that to make the greatest story and that's going to be powerful for His kingdom. So as we come to a close, I guess I would sum it up as this. We must always learn to trust God no matter what the circumstances may be in our lives. And when we fall short, when we fail, when we stumble, when we struggle, we must also learn to own up to our mistakes and apologize Not only to God, but to those who we've hurt. And let's strive to be better men and women every day.